Well, good morning. Welcome to worship here at Lena Vista United Methodist Church. My name is John Shugart, and I have the honor and privilege of serving here as pastor. I want to welcome you to this time of worship together. I'm so glad to be back and to see all of you here in this place. Just a few announcements this morning. Um, our movie night will be June 11th at 6 p.m., and we'll be watching Walk the Proud Land. So if you're able to join us June 11th, we'd love to have you here at movie night. Sorry? Yep. So correction to the date, June 9th at 6 p.m., um, and we'll be watching Walk the Proud Land. This coming Saturday at 10.30 a.m., uh, as part of the Florida Annual Conference's um, annual conference, we uh, there will be an ordination, commissioning, and licensing service, and um, Craig Brown is going to be in attendance for that, but um, Amanda Green will be licensed as a local pastor at that uh, service, and God willing, I will be commissioned as a provisional elder at that service. So if you're interested, that'll be in Lakeland at Florida Southern College in the Branscombe Auditorium, um, and that's open to whoever wants to come, and that is next Saturday at 1030 a.m. Next Sunday after church, we will have our luncheon, um, and... We also want to let everybody know that the new upper rooms are available on the back table um, and in the fellowship hall. And our final announcement, uh, just something for the community to be aware of and uh, maybe consider. Carolson Cabbage is going to need some rides to church this summer, so uh, if you're able to pick her up, um, let her know. Uh, we, we want to make sure that everyone uh, who wants to be here can be here, and that's part of how we can uh, love and serve one another. So those are all of our announcements this morning. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. Please join with me. Have you ever looked at the sunset with the sky mellow and red? And the clouds suspended like feathers, then I say you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes, he'll show it to you. I'm going to start a little bit higher. Have you ever stood in the ocean with a white foam at your feet? Felt the endless thundering motion? Then I say you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look. Open your eyes, he'll show it to you. Have you ever looked at the cross with a man hanging in pain? And the look of love in his eyes, then I say, you've seen Jesus my Lord. Have you seen Jesus my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Have you ever stood in the family with the Lord there in your midst? Seen the face of Christ on your brother? Then I say you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen, seen this Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, take a look, and open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Burn the joy, church, with the Lord there in your midst. Seen the face of Christ on your sister. 
Then I say you seen Jesus my Lord. Have you seen Jesus my Lord? He's here and claim you. Take a look, open your eyes, he'll show it to you. Morning, church. Will you join me in the call to worship? Christ is calling you as disciples. Lord Jesus, let us follow you faithfully. You will be led into fields of mission and service. Lord Jesus, where you lead us, listen for Christ's call to you. And would join me in the. Oh, are we going to do the song next? No, that's not. Okay. Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthems ring. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Come magnify, come glorify. Christ Jesus the King, majesty, worship his majesty, unto Jesus, uncomfortable King. Amen. Would you join me in the Apostles' Creed now? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we need to do our prayer to the Lord's Prayer, if you'll join me in that one. We didn't do that, did we? The, the Lord's Prayer. Oh, joys and concerns. Oh, I missed something, didn't I? I can't tell. This might be, this might be considered my first trip. Uh, welcome. It's nice to see everybody here. Are there any joys or concerns that we'd like to bring up? Right now, Dan, please. Special prayer for Dan, yes. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, I know we're waiting for a good time to visit, but we got to get him stronger. Anyone else? I, I know you're missing Sandy this morning, but uh, she's really a little bit under the weather. It's a little pain on her shoulders and arms. So, yeah, son. Pat. 
Oh, yes. I'm sure that he would. Yes, we all need to consider Mark in his uh, prayer. Oh, heaven's sakes. Oh, my. Oh, my. Well, yes, we definitely need to keep Mark in our prayers and, and may God look down on him and, and, and make his life easier. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, then please go read our Lord's Prayer, please. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's have a time of prayer together. Oh God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this worshiping community. We give you thanks for all of the ways that we uh, see and feel your presence, your love, your grace in our lives. Oh God, we come before you this morning with those things that we've shared and those things that we carry with us on our hearts and and God, we, we have faith and we trust that you hear and see those things and, and that you meet us in the midst of those. And so God, this morning we ask for those who are sick, who are in the hospital, who are dealing with illness and pain, God, that your, your comfort and your strength and your presence would be among them. That they, would, that they would experience in a real way your healing touch. That they would know that they're never alone. And God, for our brothers and sisters who, who are close to, to joining you in glory, help them to, to sense your peace that surpasses all understanding, God. And for those of us who remain behind, be with us as we grieve and mourn our friends and family. And God, we, we're so thankful that you promised to, to walk with us even in the valley of the shadow of death. So God, we give you thanks for sending your son, Jesus, who through his life, death, and resurrection defeated death and conquered sin and allowed us to allows us to to live life freely free to serve and love you and and God we we know that because of that we have the responsibility to answer the call every day in whatever small way that that we can to to spread the good news of the gospel to share your love in the world, to serve those in need. And so, God, we ask this morning that you would guide us and strengthen us as we, as followers of your Son, attempt to do that work here in Auburndale and here in Florida and, and wherever that call takes us. And we pray for this church, God. We know that you're already here, that your presence is with us, that your Holy Spirit is in this place, in each of us, and, 
and working through us, God. But we ask, again, that, that your spirit would fall fresh on us this morning. That we would leave from this place knowing that you go with us. And so we pray all of this in the mighty and powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now at this time, I'd like to invite our ushers forward to receive our tithes and offerings. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory to victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord in thee. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To those who vanquish evil, a crown of life shall be. They with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. 
and this passage of scripture is called the commissioning of the disciples. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but they but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Oh God, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable unto you. Oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In the year 1508, 33-year-old Michelangelo was hard at work at, uh, on Pope Julius II's marble tomb. And he was already an esteemed sculptor, having carved uh, famous statues like La Pieta and the statue of David. And so when he was commissioned to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he initially refused because he considered himself a sculptor and not a painter. And this morning, as I was flipping through our altar Bible, trying to uh, get to the verse in Matthew that we're reading from, I actually flipped to a page that said the Sistine Chapel um, so as you come forward for communion, uh, if you want to look at that, that's a, a picture of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. But essentially, Michelangelo doubted his ability as uh, someone that could paint uh, the frescoes required uh, to, to fill the Sistine Chapel. And he also kind of stubbornly wanted to finish the work that he was doing on this marble tomb that he was working on. However, he reluctantly accepted the commission, and he spent the next four years on scaffolding, painting the ceiling. This morning uh, with us, I see at least one person who is uh, possibly in elementary or middle school, school age uh, children. Um, and I, I don't know about you, but when I was in elementary school, uh, we learned this, this legend that Michelangelo spent the whole time painting the ceiling on his back. Um, that was sort of the folklore behind this thing. And, and as I was kind of researching this story, I guess that's not true. Uh, <laughs> so uh, he was on scaffolding very high up, uh, but it was he painted with his arms stretched out standing. So uh, that myth was sort of busted for me. Um, it felt like a small piece of my childhood was you know, lost this week uh, when I learned that. Um, but although Michelangelo was a skilled sculptor and artist, he dealt, he dealt with doubt. Uh, he actually wrote a poem about the work he was doing on the Sistine Chapel ceiling that ended with the line, I am in the wrong place. I am a painter, or I am not a painter. So, so Michelangelo, this guy who, if you look up his full name, there's like five different names, but he's so famous now, we just know him as Michelangelo. He he doubted his ability uh, to be able to paint this. Michelangelo went through a major transition in his life from a famous sculptor to a painter. Uh, he had achieved success as, as a sculptor. He had been known uh, and revered for his work on these two statues that we still, uh, we still visit today. People still visit the statue of David that he carved out of marble today. It's one of the most recognizable works. But he, he had to go through a transition uh, to accept his commission to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Uh, and upon completion of that, he had created one of the most famous works of art known to the world. And he had created uh, one of the most recognizable and replicated paintings, um, the, the creation of Adam, where God and Adam are, are reaching out their fingers towards one another. He did this after going through a major transition from a sculptor to a painter and finally accepting the commission that was given to him. So as we read in Matthew chapter 28, the, the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, the disciples 
are in the midst of a major transition. Jesus was crucified and dead, and then before this passage we read this morning, they find out that he has been raised from the dead. And Jesus told them to meet him on the mountain in Galilee, and this is where we pick up our scripture. They have arrived at this mountain, and when they see Jesus, it says that they worshipped him, but that some also doubted. The disciples were still working through their own doubt. They desperately wanted to believe that Jesus had, in fact, been raised from the dead. But, but for some of them, this, this reality or this, uh, this new way of, of being hadn't fully sunk in yet. So I thought it was interesting. I, I looked at the words worship and doubt this week and, and what those referred to in this context. And really both of those refer to a posture uh, a bodily, uh, a body language, a way of, of moving your body. So to worship in this context meant to, to fall flat on your face in, in pure reverence of, of Jesus in this case. So uh, if you picture when it says they worship, that was, that was them bowing down, falling flat on their face. Some translations say kissing the feet of Jesus, being fully committed to, to this risen Lord. And then if you look up what doubted means, it's, it's sort of this, uh, this posture where you can't figure out what to do with your body. You're trying to adopt two different stances. You're wavering between one thing and another. So if you picture you know, those first ones who, who would have fallen flat on their face in worship, but then doubting meant that they, they may have physically moved their body and, and and maybe taken a few steps back or or got up from the position of worship. They they were wavering back and forth. Some of them maybe even uh, turning away, thinking about about leaving. That doubt that actually informed the posture in their body language. So the disciples experienced doubt, and they also went through a major transition. But we. No, uh, because we, we know the rest of the story, that they ultimately did accept this commission from Jesus to go and make disciples and baptize uh, people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And because of this, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the church was birthed. And the good news of the gospel was continued, uh, continued to be spread through all the nations, uh, through history. And we here today stand in the tradition of those first disciples who accepted their commission in the midst of major transitions and in the midst of their their doubt. And we continue that work. So in in both of these stories, there are transitions and commissions. Transitions and commissions. So that word commission, I was was looking in the the dictionary uh, at all of the the many things that a commission can be or what commission is defined as. And there's really, there's like nine definitions of the word. It can be used as a noun or a verb. And I thought uh, as important as this passage of scripture is the commissioning of the disciples, that the, the definition of the word might help us think through some of what it means to be commissioned as disciples. So one of the first definitions, uh, and I'm not going to go through all nine, I'll just go through a couple, uh, has to do with art. So one definition of of being commissioned for something is a formal request to produce something, especially an artistic work in exchange for payment. So that's what led me this week to to think about artists and who had been commissioned, and I landed on Michelangelo. Uh, But essentially, if you're commissioned to create a piece of art, that means that the person willing to pay you to do that, think so highly of your skills or your gifts that they're willing to to pay you to create something for them. As Christians, we are commissioned to use our individual skills and gifts to serve the kingdom of God. And, And what that means is that God chooses to use each of us, our ordinary uh, existence, to, to shape and form uh, and continue the mission and ministry of Jesus in the world so that God's kingdom might be made known here on earth. And maybe you have a spiritual gift or skill set that you are actively using, that you know this is my thing, this is how I serve God, 
Maybe that's you. But maybe for others of us, we experience doubt like those first disciples. We're not sure how we're called to use our gifts and skills. We're not sure that we're worthy to do that. This morning, I want to encourage you that God has specifically called you and created you with certain gifts and skills to be used to further the the gospel, to be used to, to bring the kingdom here to earth. You have something inside of you that God wants to call forth in order to, to share his love and grace in the world. And even if some of us, uh, even if we're in transition, maybe we're one thing used to work for us. Maybe one gift has gone away or one skill set's not working anymore. God continues to work through the Holy Spirit, continues to call us no matter how old we are or what abilities we have. God continues to use each of us to do that work. So uh, the second definition is in a military sense. So uh, a formal or written guarantee granting the power to perform various acts or duties like the conferring of a military rank uh, or a rank of authority. So as Christians, as as followers of Jesus Christ, we aren't uh, or we shouldn't be striving towards some uh, rank or status that makes us better than the other uh, disciples. Um, and, and we have a reminder of, in this, in the Wesley Covenant prayer that sometimes we pray uh, in the new year. This prayer written by John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement. The first line says this, I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. So to follow Jesus means to go to the people Jesus went to. And oftentimes, uh, associating or going to those people isn't going to to make you higher ranked or or help you reach a a better status. But we are given a title in Romans 8, uh, 15. We're called children of God and also co-heirs with Christ. And we're given power and authority from Jesus through the Holy Spirit to do this work. The third definition of the word commission can refer to uh, a group of people who are commissioned to do some type of work or duty. If if you want to think of this in like a city commission is tasked with governing and representing uh, a city. So as disciples of Jesus Christ, we recognize that the work of making disciples is never a solo endeavor. We do this work as part of a community which is called the church. And as United Methodists, our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, which is taken from this passage in Matthew 28. And we also believe that the most significant place that disciple making occurs is in the local church, in the community. This is what it means. uh, This is what the message of Pentecost is that we we heard about last week, that that the Holy Spirit poured out on all those who were gathered uh, and birthed the church, birthed the community of believers, and and then equipped each person within that community with with different gifts and abilities and languages that they could then use to reach people in all sorts of unique contexts and places. So the fourth definition I want to talk about is uh, to be commissioned is to get to be given the authority to act for or on behalf of or in place of another. So the major transition that happens in Matthew 28 is the disciples are starting to realize that, that Jesus is no longer going to be with them in bodily presence, that Jesus is going to uh, ascend into heaven and that they will be left to do this work um, not alone, but without the presence of Jesus in his, in his human form. Thus, the disciples are given by Jesus the authority to act on or act for or on behalf of or in the place of Jesus. The only way for this message of good news to continue to spread is if we, followers of Jesus, acting for or on behalf of, or in the place of Jesus, continue to do the work, continue to tell the story, continue to spread the good news. And 
Jesus gives them that power and authority to continue to, to go and to do that work. So part of the, the work that we see in this scripture that we are commissioned to do is to baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism marks a major transition in somebody's life. And then it results in being asked if that person will accept their commission to continue doing the work of what Jesus is calling us to do. In the United Methodist Church, we ask folks who are being presented for baptism, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? When we baptize in the people in the United Methodist Church, it's a symbol of God's grace that is already at work in their life. It marks a transition from the old life to the new, and it brings that person into the Christian community officially to be a part of the family, so to speak. And it also marks a moment where that person is commissioned into the ministry and mission of Jesus Christ and making disciples. Each of us in our lives have probably faced some sort of major transition, uh, and each of us have probably answered uh, the commission in some way, shape, or form. I know in my life, uh, I, I'm on the, the precipice of a major transition. I am uh, going on Saturday, hopefully, to be commissioned as a provisional elder in the United Methodist Church. And that, that's been a, a long process filled with doubt, filled with hesitation, filled with wavering, uh, figuring out how to answer my call transitioning from a seminary student uh, to a candidate for ministry. And, and now I'm on the, the verge again of a major transition where, where I have to answer the call to be commissioned once again. So going back to the Michelangelo story, uh, because there's more to it, he was known for being an excellent sculptor. And he was. He'd created those two famous pieces of and we're told that he had this doubt that he couldn't be a painter, that, you know, I'm a sculptor, not a painter. He was wavering on whether he should accept this massive job to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling. But there's really more to the story because he was an apprentice, essentially a disciple of a man called Gerlon Deo, who was, you know, an artist who owned this massive workshop in Florence. And it was, it was at this workshop that Michelangelo actually honed his drawing skills. He was practicing uh, some of those skills he would then eventually use to paint the chapel. And he had also learned about painting frescoes uh, from more experienced artists there. And when he began the work, he also took some trusted artists with him to get the, the job going. So what, I guess what I'm trying to say is Michelangelo was in the process of, of being discipled, of being a learner, of having relationships that would have helped him reach the, the point where he could eventually paint such a beautiful work. Making disciples is not a one and done process. We're not here just to ask folks to say a prayer and come up to the altar. Making Disciples is an ongoing process of relationship and encouragement and mentoring and learning that, that lasts a lifetime. People in my life, so many people, have discipled and are discipling me, helping me to understand who I am, what gifts and skills I have, helping me to, to realize um, that I am, in fact, called, that that's not just something uh, internal, it's something external. And then offering me opportunities to lead and to serve, encouraging me and ultimately helping me to accept this call uh, to go through a transition from someone who just loves the local church to someone who's willing to serve uh, and give my life to it as a, a full-time clergy person. So the work of disciple-making is to form those deep relationships, to embody uh, the fruits of the Spirit 
to exemplify and teach what Jesus taught and to gather people in and then to bring them along for the journey with us, to encourage them and learn from them as we all do this work and live this way of life together. And that's, that's why we have the church. That's why we gather as the body of Christ. And this church, Lena Vista United Methodist Church, is on the verge also of a transition. Uh, in a few weeks, there will be a pastoral transition. Uh, and Amanda will come and, and I will leave. And, and perhaps uh, for some, that's uh, a season of uncertainty. Maybe there's some, some doubt. Uh, maybe you're not sure what's going to happen next. But I want to uh, encourage you and tell you that the good news is you already have each other. The church is going to be here no matter who the pastor is. And you've also already accepted the commission as a gathered body of Christ to do the work. And that work of disciple making and sharing the good news of creating transformation in lives and in the world, that's, that's going to be there whoever comes in and sits in the pews or whoever is preaching from the pulpit. That work is ongoing, but this place and you all are here and you have accepted the work. So I want to encourage you to keep going. It says, go therefore. I want to encourage you to keep going. To keep going to those who are lost, to those who are left out, to those who are left behind and, and gathering them in bringing them along and encouraging them, discipling them, baptizing them so that they might experience and know in a real way the love and grace of Jesus Christ. So I want you to notice two things from this passage as I close. The first thing is, in the midst of their doubts, it says in the very next verse that Jesus came to them. Jesus doesn't see their doubts and say, maybe I should find a new group of people to do this work. Jesus doesn't say they're not ready for that. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause this and wait for another time. In the midst of their doubts, Jesus moves towards them. He never gave up on his disciples, and Jesus never gives up on us either. Amen? So the second thing is that Jesus says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then it says, go, therefore. All of this hinges on the power and authority of Jesus. If we don't put that at the center of everything we do, then it doesn't mean anything. If, if we don't put Jesus at the center of our lives as the one that we pursue first, as we then you know, pursue and share that message and serve others. It's all for nothing. Because everything hinges on the power and authority of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. And everything relies on the empty tomb and the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And so we do what we do because of what Jesus has first done for us. This is our response to the grace that we've been shown through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we do that because Jesus has given us the commission, has shared with us his power and authority to share this story, to embody God's great love for us, to seek out the lost and to gather them in, and to help co-create a new reality, a new world, a new vision of what it's like to live in the peace and love and grace of God. And here's the good news. In our transitions, in our doubts, as we try our best to answer the commission to, to go and serve and love others, we're not left to do that alone. Jesus promises at the end of this passage that, that he would be with each of us always until the end of the age. And that's by the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is with us as we do this work, that the Holy Spirit lives within each of us, lives within you, and also works through us and through the community to do this work. So we come to the table this morning to remember that, to 
to remember what Jesus has done for us, to to have an experience with God's grace, to commune with one another and with Jesus, because Jesus is here with us at this table. And Jesus promises to be with us to the end of the age, and, and that age is the age of the church. And we remember in our communion liturgy that that when Jesus comes back, we'll feast at his heavenly banquet, uh, and everything will be made right and be made new. And so we remember that this morning as we hear this invitation. So in remembrance of these, in the mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving and the holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the Christ is God, Christ is the Christ is God pour out your Holy Spirit on us together on these gifts of bread. May it be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by it. And by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in the final victory to be peace that is at the end. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. 
forward. Uh, we'll be taking communion by the help of our function. I wish we could take a seed, a piece of bread, and we can then dip it in the cup. Uh, in the United Methodist Church, we have an open table, which means you don't have to be a member of this church or any church uh, to participate in this. Church. This is this is Jesus. This is us. the one who wants to have. Take our bread, we ask you. Take our hearts, we love you. Take our lives, oh Father, we are yours. We are yours. Yours as we stand at the table you set. Yours as we eat the bread. Our hearts can't forget we are your life. We are your, we are poor, but we but ourselves the best we could. We are yours, we are yours. Take our bread, we ask you, take our hearts. We love you, take our lives, oh Father, we are yours, we are yours. Yours as we stand at the table you set, yours as we eat the bread, our heart can't forget. We are the sign of your life with us yet. We are yours, we are yours. Take our bread, we ask you. Take our hearts, we love you. Take our lives, oh Father, we are Yours, we are yours. Your holy people standing washed in your blood, spirit filled yet hungry, we await your food. We are poor, but we brought ourselves the best we could. We are yours. We are yours. Take our bread, we ask you. Take our hearts, we love you. Take our lives, oh Father, we are yours. We are Will you pray with me? Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand now as you're able and sing our hymn of response, Have Thine Own Way, Lord.
as you go from this place uh, in the doubts that you carry, in the transitions that you face, in the commissions that you uh, have accepted and are being asked to call, be encouraged that, that God has chosen and called you, that the Holy Spirit equips you to do the work and that we don't do it alone. So hear this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Now let's join hands. Go in peace to love and serve.